Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name's Nesh Nikolic and my guest today is Professor Yolanda Yetan. And she is a social psychologist and professor at the University of Queensland with research interests focusing on social inequality and also social identity, social groups, and social dynamics. She has studied how identity changes in response to stigma and oppression, social inequality, the transition of identity throughout lifespans, and also the implications of social identity and inequality on general health. Professor Yetan commenced at the University of Queensland in 1998 after moving to Australia from the Netherlands and relocated to the University of Exeter in the UK for six years before returning to University of Queensland as a research fellow in 2007. For her work, Professor Yetan received the 2004 British Psychological Society Spearman Medal and in 2014 received the European Association of Social Psychologies Kurt Lewin Medal. She was named a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia in 2015 and also received in 2011 an ARC Future Fellowship. Professor Yetan is an incredible researcher in this space. It was an absolute pleasure to have her on the show. Uh, I found out a lot of things about inequality that I just simply haven't even thought of. It just hasn't been a topic that's been in my mind so much. So I'm very appreciative to her for taking the time and I know you'll enjoy it. Social inequality is certainly something that needs to be addressed and it's in the interest of all of our lives, including the the way that we leave the world for our children. So I think this is a topic that I'm going to hopefully explore further with future guests as well. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Yolanda Yetan for for today's interview. Enjoy. Yolanda, big thank you for coming onto the show. I know that you're very busy and appreciate your time coming along to talk to me about you know, inequality in the world and, and you know, where, where it comes from and, and, you know, the importance of addressing this as a conversation. I think uh, all of us as human beings have recognised many times where, you know, life uh, is unfair and, you know, that, that happens right from birth uh, through to the end of life. Uh, but I think it is a topic that, that does need a voice and uh, I'd love to find out more about about this space uh, as as many of us talk about it but we're not necessarily informed from a you know a research base so um, hopefully today we can get to the bottom of at least some of some of this space my pleasure thank you for having me tell me a little bit about about yourself i know that you're a social psychologist that that you're at uq you've been looking at this space along with others as well for some time what's it's brought you into uh, having a passion or an interest in in looking at inequality? Well, I guess for me it, it started when me just reading a book, uh, The Spirit Level by Wilkinson and Pickett. That's a, a book that's, that's really uh, has made a huge impact in the field. And basically their message is that if you try and if you look at all sorts of uh, social and health problems uh, and you try and predict in which countries – that is the worst, then you're not getting very far if you were to look at um, uh, GDP, for instance. Um, There's no correlation there. But as soon as you start to uh, rank uh, countries along the inequalities uh, that are in them, and by that they define it very much as the difference between the poor and the wealthy in in a society. And you often capture that by the Gini coefficient, which is an index 
uh, that uh, the World Bank is actually um, uh, calculating and distributing. Once you actually start ranking countries along their inequalities, then you find a perfect correlation. So with all sorts of social problems um, that has to do with violence, uh, aggression, but even teenage births, all sorts of issues like that, health, um, early mortality, uh, all sorts of illnesses, you find that countries where there's high levels of inequality uh, in terms of the Gini coefficient, that those problems are worse. Um, so at the top, you see that uh, the US, a very unequal society, has a lot of those social and health problems. Um, at the other end, you have the Scandinavian countries where there's low inequalities, uh, Japan where there's low inequalities, where you have far fewer of those social and health problems. So for me, I found that very intriguing because if inequality is such a strong predictor, uh, wealth inequality in a country is such a strong predictor um, of all these very important outcomes, then uh, it was almost a bit like, well, we need to get our head around it. What's happening here? And uh, for us, it was very much that a social psychologist, we're very much interested in the processes. Uh, so you have that question, why is inequality uh, so bad for all these countries, leading to these negative outcomes. What are the processes there? And that is something that we've been studying over the last couple of years. It's such a complex space, as as I think you're you're referencing there in terms of there's a process that goes around it. There's you know so many factors that. Mm. Uh, and and even difficulties within definitions. You know, as you were talking, I immediately thought to myself, "How do we even define what is you know uh, rich or what is poor? Do we take the outliers out of that? Is it um, you know how do we account for you know very wealthy some who you know in, there are countries with great." Um, corruption and the like that that store a lot of you know a country's wealth etc cetera, etc cetera. it must be a very complex space to try and understand you know uh, at, 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 at the sort of uh, meta scale but also at that sort of micro as well to, to maybe look at it, a community that is uh, you know might might also have some you know, inequalities well definitely does have you know, inequalities in itself as well so how, how does psych, social psychology or how do you go out and account for these these uh, differences? How, how do we make sure that our data sets are, are um, uh, representative uh, or, or account for you know these anomalies in you know, when we are looking between countries and the like? Yeah, look that's that's a great question. Um, what we actually did is, that we said, look, we can look at the actual inequality as captured by the Gini coefficients, uh, whereby, so the Gini coefficient is simply a, a value that varies between zero and one. One means that all the wealth in a community or a country uh, is, uh, is actually located within one individual. So that's the most extreme form of inequality. Uh, and then zero is when we all have the same amount of money. There are no differences in how much we have. There are other indices too. Sometimes they'll look at the top 20% in a country, what they own versus the, the bottom 20% and how much is the gap between the two. But what we found very interesting is that you can look at these objective indicators, um, but sometimes it's not so much the objective indicators, but it is these more subjective perceptions that are far more important if you try and predict outcomes. So if you, for instance, think of the uh, global financial crisis, what that did was it created a great awareness in all societies, Western societies, about the inequalities. People started marching in the streets and they said, look, Suddenly, the, you know, we see the inequality and we don't think it's fair and we want to challenge it. Um, but actually, if you look at the Gini coefficients, that stayed constant over that whole period. 
But if you look in the media, uh, on Twitter, or online uh, uh, media, uh, you can certainly see that suddenly it became a topic. It became something that people were worried about and that affected their political attitudes, their attitudes about how society needs to be organized, but also their, their fears for the future. Um, and as psychologists, we're, we're often more interested in those more subjective perceptions because if you want to understand well-being, whether people are concerned about the future, you need to understand the subjective perceptions, not so much the objective perceptions. And particularly if those subjective perceptions are collectively shared, if we all, if it becomes a topic of conversation where we all agree that inequality is out of control and it's not fair, then you can understand how that motivates uh, collective actions, a, a mass collective action, a mass mobilization, um, and even political unrest. So one of the studies, for instance, that we uh, published years ago is basically where we show that if you, the more that uh, we looked at 28 countries uh, and we looked at levels of inequality, we looked at uh, objective inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient, but also asked people in these 28 countries how high they felt inequality was. Interestingly, both predicted, um, uh, first of all, that people thought that society uh, um, was going in the wrong direction, that there was a lot of chaos, moral decline, um, that we call it anomie. There is a sociological construct that you actually feel that uh, uh, society is collapsing. Um, and the more that you actually feel that there is inequality, the more you actually also think that society is collapsing. And what we then found was that that also then predicted the quest for a strong leader, a leader who is willing to get things done, but even through undemocratic uh, means. So what you then can see is that inequality, the more that we see inequality, we see that society is collapsing and we want someone strong to come in to fix things for us. So perhaps this can help us to understand the rise of um, extremism, extreme leaders, populist leaders in many different countries in Europe and the US, of course, or this this quest for someone who, who just takes over even though if it's it's just not uh, through democratic means. It's uh, so interesting because we we almost see so much of a voice you know being repeated now that you know the world is falling apart and that you know we're going into chaos and you know that that uh, this sort of uh, world is so unequal, but I'm, I'm hearing that's not necessarily the objective in a measure that that we're we're, we're seeing fairly yeah, stable, right. fairly stable. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming, and please please let me know if I'm wrong here as well. I'm assuming that maybe on a on a on a world level, it's improving over time from the 1950s to to now. Have we seen an an improvement, or, or is it just of inequality? Same? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, in actual fact, it's <laughs> the last 30 years, uh, inequalities have, uh, have become bigger. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. So you have after the world war, the, that was quite an equalizer, uh, the 1950s when everyone, um, yeah, there was, there was, uh, a boom, economic boom and many people benefited from it. So inequalities were fairly small. But especially in the 80s, uh, inequalities became much larger. But as I mentioned, uh, it's, based, it's, it's only when uh, uh, the global financial crisis hit that people and, and when all, you know, when that was shown um, on display, uh, you may remember the, the 99% movement uh, where it's, it's all of us, the 99% who actually uh, feeling that the 1% are gambling with the world resources. Um, so at the moment, actually, inequalities are very high. Um, I believe uh, Oxfam did a report um, a couple of years ago I, where the eight wealthiest individuals in the world earn about 50% of all the, the world's resources and, and wealth 
all the money in the world. So it's concentrated in a few individuals, which brings a lot of imbalances with it. And these people become very powerful, more powerful than many governments. So it creates unrest, instability. Uh, and that in and of itself can, uh, from a psychological point of view, um, can do all sorts of things. It creates anxieties uh, among people, um, but also it 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 deteriorate, deteriorates, it, it, it lowers trust. Um, so the more that you have inequalities in a society, there are very strong links there that it's associated with lower trust among people. They don't trust their neighbors anymore, uh, not as much at least, uh, uh, and also not government, uh, 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 those in charge. Um, the other process that uh, we see is really strongly affected by uh perceptions of inequality is, is the perceptions of competition within society. So the more that you have these huge inequalities, the more that you have a, get a us versus them dynamic where the poor see themselves as in opposition to the interests of the wealthy. Uh, and that us them dynamic creates not only hostility, but also greater competition over resources, it becomes a bit of a doggy dog -dog society. And that in and of itself uh, can be very stressful, especially if you're at the bottom of that hierarchy. Uh, and it is associated with all sorts of more aggressive forms, uh, behaviors. We find that intergroup hostility is on the rise in uh, intergroup, uh, in, in highly unequal societies. But even as Wilkinson and Pickett show is that in more unequal societies, there are far more people who are employed in security jobs because it becomes a more dangerous society. You need to protect your assets, right? Uh, it's it's more lawless. Uh, it's uh, things get out of control. So in many ways, it's associated with um, societies that are less healthy, that are less um, you know, vibrant, and and um, more negative outcomes. How how. Do we see, you know, the process of inequality occurring? Is is this coming from these individuals becoming more and more powerful who have got a greater say? Is it the way that um, countries run in terms of the distribution of wealth and obviously policies that, that countries um, look at? Obviously, you know, in a country like Australia, I'm, uh, you know, with a, with a tax system that does work means that we all pay tax, which means that it does get distributed. And, um, you know, that probably has, a, you know, a, a, an effect on, on inequalities. Um, how, how, what are the mechanisms or the processes that we find, you know, I'm assuming war often, you know, uh, can, can mean that, um, or, or unrest in a country can, can mean that inequalities, you know, continue to rise. Can you talk us through a little bit about what are the con contributors that, countries face or um you know maybe the flip side would be how do we remedy yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. some of it I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's one of the same sort of question yeah look uh, i think uh, it, it is interesting because inequalities are very high uh, it's certainly something that is not only now high on the agenda of social scientists like myself but it's also something that's politicians start to talk about. Uh, Barack Obama was very outspoken about uh, inequality, the gap between the wealthy and the poor in the US being not just something that is a moral problem, but he was very aware of the fact that that undermines uh, uh, economic growth. At some stage, inequalities are so high that it uh, damages the economy, right? If you're at the bottom of that hierarchy, you know, you become powerless. Whatever you do, it doesn't really help you to, to get up. And the wealthy, well, the whole trickle-down uh, economics uh, uh, is uh, we're now clear that that's not working. So Obama was very much sort of emphasizing that uh, for societies uh, to become healthier economically, but also just really in, in terms of actual physical health, 
uh, we need to reduce inequalities. Um, it's very hard to do that, though. Um, there's one other person who is repeatedly actually pointing to the problem of inequality is uh, the current Pope. Um, he calls it, I think, the... Uh, uh, the evil of the the evil of this age or something. So it is interesting that they understand the the very damaging effects that it can have. Um, but uh, I think the positive development though is that over the last ten years too, you see that there are many organisations, the OECD, uh, uh, many you know many organisations, uh, countries are starting to be motivated to reduce the gap between the poor and, and the wealthy, because I understand that that can have uh, many benefits um, for everyone. This is the interesting point uh, that uh, Wilkinson and Pickett uh, make in their book. Um, so their book is titled The Spirit Level, and they're saying that why inequality, uh, why equality is better for everyone. And this is uh, an interesting point that they say, look, of course, that's that's a no-brainer. If you're poor in a very unequal country, that's, that's incredibly uh, uh, very poor, a bad position to be in. But they say, actually, if you look at the impact that inequality has, it is also equally damaging for those at the top of uh, the, the pay distribution. Uh, so at, at that, some stage, I even have this wonderful quote where they talk about, well, if you really want to live the American dream, right, sort of make it, uh, then you better move to Denmark because of the very low economic inequalities that they have there. Even as a wealthy person, you would be better off in a country like Denmark than in the US, um, which is an interesting uh, point because... Um, and again, we've done quite a bit of work on that, uh, why that would be. Why as a wealthy person are you also, uh, um, well, is it psychologically actually quite stressful to be in an unequal society? Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. As I mentioned before, it's those societies are very competitive. You're at the top of the hierarchy and, you know, you always need to work harder and compete more to stay at that level. And the other one is what we call the, the fear of falling. If you live in a very unequal society, that's very, and inequality is associated with unrest. People perceive it's unfair, it's unjust. Uh, when you are at the top, you can also, your, your status position isn't very secure. You can fall very low. Uh, and that in and of itself is very stressful. So you may need to resort to all sorts of means, uh, uh, legal, illegal, to hold on to that position. And so it becomes, uh, it, you know, the sec there is no security. And psychologically speaking, speaking, that's, um, we know that that's associated with stress, but also it's, uh, mental health uh, issues, etc. It seems to me that inequality uh, is, in many ways, well, it certainly is unavoidable, but in, 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 in many ways it's actually healthy. The, the question here is we're asking what level of inequality, yeah. Yeah. And, and so where there is a lower differential between the low and the high, it's still valuable and useful and, in actual fact, healthy for there to be a lower gap because those who are even at the highest uh, you know, echelons in fact uh, get to enjoy a country um, and everything that it brings. There's a safety net uh, and they can still be very uh, wealthy and enjoy that versus in a place where they might have you know, even more wealth potentially, but the risks are always high. They're constantly, you know, you know, yeah. you know looking yeah. out for themselves. And I'm assuming there's very good reason for some people to be, you know, at that highest level because they have risked more, they've educated themselves more, they've invested more, they've worked longer hours, yep. they've worked harder jobs, whatever it might be, um, where people also want to be rewarded for putting in effort. If it's if it's completely that everyone gets paid the same, you know, that's not a healthy, you know, psyche for many people. We're, we're trying to find a space where it works for a population but the, the, there's not inequality and equity that is so high that that if you're at the bottom, you end up just uh, yep. you know 
uh, just trying to survive to to take a breath, um, you know, and, and and everything else is out of your out of your reach. Yeah, look, I I, I fully agree, and I think that's an important point. It's not that uh, uh, inequality is bad per se. It is indeed about the level. A certain level of inequality can be very uh, uh, productive, very useful for a country. Indeed, that if you are willing to uh, invest and work hard and and do go the extra mile, that you have benefits from that, that you differentiate yourself positively from others who are not willing to do that, right? So that uh, merits uh, and and uh, hard work is actually rewarded. So that that certainly is the case. What I'm talking about is that. Um, when inequalities get out of control, right? Yes. When the gap between the poor and wealthy is so extreme that it becomes stifling uh, at both levels, right? It's not just for the poor who, who just see that there's no future for them. They will never be able to climb the ladder because, uh, uh, be, uh, uh, but also for the wealthy who, as I mentioned, uh, there's these huge insecurities uh, about Still, there's this upward comparison. I already have an awful lot, but I want more. That's what one of the studies that we uh, that we show uh, uh, that we ran that we that we show that if there's actually more inequality in a society, it becomes um, almost a bit a little, wealth becomes addictive. So there's a really nice research that was done in the U.S. where with the 50 states, there's quite a lot of um, a, a big difference in the inequalities uh, that they have. So they simply looked at the 50 states and, uh, um, you know, listed the inequalities and they looked at uh, Google searches for luxury goods. Um, and what you find is uh, a correlation. So in more unequal states, that there were more Google searches for those type of luxury goods. Um, and so what we, we actually replicated that effect and showed that if there's higher levels of inequality, that people also say they want more, they want more wealth. So it becomes this issue of you have a lot, but you, because of inequalities, you always need to gain more. It becomes a little bit like an addiction. Uh, I wonder addiction. if, um, sorry to jump in, I wonder if yeah, that's sure. potentially a function of uh, if, you, if, if you have a lot, but there's still unrest, to maintain your safety, you need more. You need to go out and you know hoard or you need to maintain your power uh, because there's always someone who's you know, potentially wanting to knock you off the perch yep. um, to yep. take your power. So it's, you know, it's almost, you know, I hate to mention in this, these terms, but it's almost like a, um, you know, kind of like the mafia, you know, take, taking, you know, a section of, of a city or whatever it might be. You've got to keep everyone out. You've got to maintain a power, a dominance, a strength to, to yeah, yeah. You know, because it's ruthless. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's different potentially, I'm, I'm assuming in a country like, you know, uh, Australia, obviously, you know, the uh, Scandinavian countries, um, I'm assuming they're at the lower level from a yeah, that's right. World, world scale in terms of you know inequality, uh, am I am I right there? Um, I, uh, Australia is probably in in the middle. It's not okay. very high, but it's also not all that low. Actually, it's uh, higher than uh, many uh, northern European countries. Uh, the level of inequality. Um, but just to go back to your previous point. Um, one of the things that we, it's certainly the case that if you're wealthier, you want to have more wealth, but that's also because those societies, wealth becomes very, very important to define who you are. So we ran a few studies where uh, it's a sort of a fictional society. We either, you know, so you just have to imagine you're a participant in a study. You are being told that you're going to be part of this society. We call it Bimbola. Um, and either this is a very unequal society or a very equal society. And uh, we then, in the second part of the study, say to you, well, you're going to meet a person. Um, this is Christine, uh, Christine, and, and you're going to interact with her for, for an hour or so. And there are a number of questions that you can ask her. How interested are you to find out the answers 
to these questions. And we have a number of things in there. You know, what are our hobbies? What is our favorite food? But also, what is our wealth? What is our education? Um, what's our income in our current job? So we find that if people have been allocated to the more unequal society, they're more likely to want to know answers to those questions. So, our, And we also find uh, that if people in those more unequal societies have to describe themselves, they're using more wealth-related words. Right. So the conclusion for us is that if you live in a more unequal society, wealth becomes a very important uh, question, right? Just as much as we meet someone and we know that gender, race, uh, age are very important uh, categorizations that we use, the more unequal a society becomes, the more that we want to know about the wealth of someone that we meet, because we feel that that tells us something that is important to understand the social world around us. We want to know where in the hierarchy they fit. If we live in a very equal society, well, that's not a relevant question because we all have the same and we know that. But in a more unequal society, we do know that if you're a very wealthy person, you live probably in a very different world, uh, neighborhood, you have a different job than someone who is poor. So it's, it's, it's an important indicator. And we also know that once something is an important uh, categorization, uh, 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 you know, the basis for categorization, then we want to score well on that. We want to be wealthy. We want to uh, belong, you know, to the winner's group, not the loser's group. That's so interesting. I, I haven't thought of it in, in that way that when there's equality, people are not interested in that identity nearly as much, you know, because there, there's no need to, the, the, the differences aren't great. Yeah. So therefore that's, you know, in many ways probably not relevant or even not, not that interesting uh, versus if the differences are great, uh, there's an immediate um, comparison being made you know it's almost like when someone says oh hi you know you're meeting someone what do you do you know there's there's an inherent calculation in someone's mind that, that goes and says where do they you know what's their status yeah. you know we talk about yeah. it in a status yeah. perspective and this is yeah. why titles and labels and other yeah. things are so important um yeah. is that you know we all we all consider it right we we, yeah. we like it and we like to uh you know uh, uh, know where we stand and and uh and we can be intimidated just by status even though the human being is very pleasant that's and right and, yeah. and we can get frightened about it yeah yeah one one study that uh uh i i felt was very exciting that we did uh, a couple of years ago uh uh, Kim Peters, who's now uh, a professor at the University of Exeter, she led this research. Uh, we looked at, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, Google Books? I'm not quite sure. It's a, it's a database where they have digitized something like 40 million books from the beginning of, uh, uh, well, just starting 1910, I think, up until now. Uh, and so for that whole a time spectrum, uh, 100 years, we also know the Gini coefficient in the US, for instance. Um, so you look at the fluctuations in the Gini coefficients, and she ran a computer program which would look at wealth-related words in all of those novels. Um, and uh, so there were about 35 different wealth-related words uh, around poverty, about wealth. And what she found is in those novels that there was quite a nice correlation with actual levels of inequality, objective inequality in a society, and the number of times in these novels that wealth-related words were being used. So that shows you, again, a little bit that if we live in a world that's very unequal, that becomes a narrative, that because becomes something that, that uh, uh, well, occupies our minds and, and is guiding our behavior. If I'm, uh, um, you know, thinking of a fictional story even, think about the Charles Dickens stories. I mean, they're all about wealth, about where you are in a position. So almost this idea of, well, that was at a time that there were huge inequalities. Wealth was incredibly important to determine basic outcomes for people in that society. And we would argue that at the moment, 
uh, that's that's still the case. Uh, it's again the case that uh, there are huge inequalities that determine people's futures and their their uh, opportunities. One other thing I would like to add to that, and that's an interesting one, is that, uh, and you alluded to it earlier, the perceptions of fairness um, of that inequality. We're very accepting of inequality as long as it's associated with meritocracy, right? That everyone who works hard and has a particular skill is actually able to, is rewarded for that and can climb the ladder, uh, right? Those, those very, if you're poor, but very bright, yes, you can actually still make it, the American dream type of idea. Um, so we do see that, that um, as long as people believe that there's fairness, uh, despite inequality, they're very forgiving. And they say, that's fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But what we often see is that the greater the inequality is, the lower you actually, the ability is to climb the ladder. Uh, the actually, uh, the, the numbers at the moment of uh, how do you call it again, intergenerational um, sort of uh, uh, mobility are lower than ever. So we have high levels of inequality and everyone, especially those at the bottom of the hierarchy, are stuck in those positions. And this is what people start to experience that, um, you know, despite the fact that there are many very skilled people at the lower end of the the income level, they're not able to um, to to actually flourish and to climb the ladder and to gain that wealth. And that's when people start to say this is unfair. That's when social unrest starts to emerge and when people start to challenge uh, the current system. Uh, so that's an important, I think, qualification. Mm -hmm. It's not about actual levels of inequality. It's about our perceptions of the fairness of that inequality. <laughs> And that's interesting because it goes into that conversation around mobility, being able to you know, perceive that you can climb up. And, and yep. I know from my uh, uh, country of origin in Serbia, um, you know, there's a lot of um, you know, very well educated people who, you know, there's they've got a effectively a free um, you know university um, you know system, so a lot of people can educate themselves, but they come out. You know, with great qualifications and no jobs, and 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 there's just yeah. unemployment, and so you know, mobility, you know, sadly is often about who you know, not yeah. necessarily yeah. you know your 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 hard work, and so there are certain personalities that might be able to thrive, but they are kind of like the movers and shakers and people who are, you know, very uh, um, you know, potentially you know driven and determined, you know, and 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 you know, willing to kind of, you know. Uh, get involved and, and, and push. But if you're not that personality, which is a very unique one, uh, you kind of get left behind and, and, and there are no options. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's also interesting about, you know, the moment you're in an environment like that, we know, you know, as psychologists, what core beliefs do. And once someone has a core belief that says, I cannot progress upwards, you stop trying. And so even if, the opportunity is in front of you, you don't take it, um, and, 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 you know, yeah. and which makes sense. Why would you if if all you've seen from your family and your parents and others around you that uh, there's no point of trying? That's um, right. It only makes sense to not try because you're wasting yeah. your energy. Well, only a fool would 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 try something, um, you know, knowing the outcome is not going to be positive. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. And I guess, especially if you look at uh, the US, that is the trend that, uh, that uh, we've seen over the last decades, growing levels of inequality, but also mobility actually uh, getting uh, uh, lower and lower. In, in Australia, too, there are mobility issues that with the current generation, uh, you know, the the upward mobility is much lower than it was for their parents, say. And that creates, uh, you know, um, yeah, resentment, uh, uh, rightly so, I think, and also less a willingness to accept that the status quo is fair and just, right? So people are more interested now uh, than ever to to um, you know think of ways to reduce inequalities or voting for politicians who actually put that uh, on their agenda I imagine that's why the, the, this conversation you know, that I suppose not only for Australia but it's, it's the entire world at the moment 
you know, with the concept of inflation or, or, you know, the actual inflation is that people who are, you know, in good jobs and also in high paying, reasonable paying jobs, um, even they're struggling, for example, to buy a home. You know, the, right. the, the cost of living is high. The cost of, you know, getting into a home and owning your own home, you know, that concept was almost the given once upon a time. I believe, I don't know that for a fact, but, you know, it was very, um, uh, uh, very much in 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 someone's capacity, and that capacity is becoming harder and harder with with prices as as, as they are and continuing to grow. Yeah. Um. So that th- that's where that kind of unrest or, or kind of helplessness, hopelessness yeah. starts to occur, and people yeah. become kind of like yeah. the us and them that you mentioned earlier in the conversation. It's kind of like you know those who can, and then there's the rest of us. That's right. And 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 look, we're very much talking now about uh, what's happening in societies, but we've also studied these, uh, you know, the, the, the consequences of inequality in organizations. There are some organizations that are very flat and some where there is a huge gap between what the 20% at the bottom earn and what the 20% uh, senior management earns. And also there you find very clearly that uh, those organizations it's, it's only negative outcomes associated with higher levels of inequality in terms of there's less trust, people perceive there's more uh, competition. Um, they identify less with the organization, they have less lower job satisfaction. And importantly, too, uh, we find that people perceive that there's more of a toxic uh, uh, culture Right? That they've perceived that there's more bullying and also uh, far fewer positive interpersonal interactions. So um, it it is of interest, of course, and that's that's uh, what uh, some of my colleagues here are working on. Uh, Nick Steffens, uh, who is an associate professor here at the School of Psychology, um, he's going to look in the next couple of years really at CEO pay versus uh, uh, you know what the the average worker earns. Uh, on the work floor. And uh, um, it's it's very clear, psychologically speaking, of course, that's that's the worst thing you can actually do, uh, pay your CEO so much. Uh, and uh, especially now, as you say, with, uh, with lots of inflation, with uh, stagnating uh, uh, um, salaries, uh, that is creating a lot of resentment uh, that uh, suddenly we, we don't re- really see it as fair anymore. If we all... Uh, have it mm. tough. Why is the CEO still getting a bonus this year, right? Uh, so, what what what's the sort of research that that you've come across or your colleagues in in this space of how do uh, how do we do this better? How do we turn the ship around? And you know, I you know, I use the the um, uh, analogy of a ship because I know that ships take a very long time to turn around they've got a large mass and and it's not easy to just you know swivel them around and off you go how do we what are the sort of um uh, interventions the policies what, what 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 are countries that are doing doing it better than australia are doing and and other countries that that are you know uh, at, at that lower end how can we start to improve uh, the inequality um differential yeah, look, I, I I think that's indeed the <laughs> very important question. Next step, uh, we can map it all out. We can show how damaging inequalities are, but what do you do about it? And how do you also get people to raise consciousness and awareness of these issues and that it is an urgent problem that is, you know, needs to be addressed, not just the bottom of society is, is unhappy, but it has so many negative consequences that it's worth investing uh, time in. The problem is, of course, that if you are at the top of the pyramid, um, it's we know from research that uh, wealthy people are less likely to see inequalities and also they don't really see it as a problem. Uh, and that is because um, they're motivated not to see it, right? Uh, I mean, it's 
you know, I, it works for me. So you get in this uh, motivated reasoning why uh, I actually made it to the top because I'm so smart or whatever it may be, uh, undeserving of my wealth. So why would I actually pay more tax, right? So I'm undeserving. We also know from research, though, that sometimes if you're very wealthy, you uh, get these sort of, you get segregation, you get uh, you live in a neighborhood where only wealthy people live and you just really don't understand what poverty means, not being able to put food on the table or just that you have to send your kids to school hungry. It's not even on your radar because none of the people that you interact with on a daily basis have those problems. And, you know, there's television shows where you suddenly have these swaps uh, between very poor people that are mm. suddenly living the wealthy life and vice versa. It gets at that, but uh, um, so as uh, so it maps that out quite nicely. That you know, if we are very wealthy, we don't really see the problem of poverty and inequality. So that's a hurdle, right? So because it is also wealthy people who are running the country and are in in charge of uh, decision making bodies and government, etc. Uh, if this is not uh, something they see or see as a problem how, uh, you know, there's certainly not much going to happen. But as I started off with, I think that there is now, uh, compared to, say, even 10 years ago, inequality is on the political agenda. Uh, there's certainly uh, concerted efforts um, um, to, to, to do something. And it's also clear that these little issues like, oh, we were just uh, sort of... Uh, um, uh, you know, if you that it is about alleviating poverty, it's very clear now that no, it needs tax reform. It, it requires actually closing the gap where you're lifting uh, those at the poorer level, but also the wealthy need to actually pay for that. The gap needs to close. Um, uh, but uh, and I find it interesting. We're doing a little bit of research on that right now. Not surprisingly, that the wealthier you are, the less likely you're interested in those more drastic solutions like tax reform. Uh, people will say, "Oh, you know, let's let's just give poor people some, you know, some." Uh, I'm happy to increase the benefits, do all sorts of things at the margin, but not those more drastic uh, um, uh, things. Um, at the same time, we do see, too, that the more that people perceive that there is inequality, the more they also understand that drastic solutions are required, uh, uh, such as uh, increasing taxes for the wealthy, um, doing all sorts of things uh, to, to really uh, close the gap. Uh, that would be an interesting one, and I certainly see that uh, you know the 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 sort of policy makers that uh, in in uh, uh, it's it's certainly that 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 becomes clear that it's not just some nudging here and there and oh you know you do some you go on a course as uh, an unemployed person to just skill up it's not the individual level's responsibility this is a societal problem that we need to solve collectively. As a professor who's obviously been you know, uh, researching this space and you're rubbing shoulders with others who are passionate in this space and you've got you know so so much research under under your belt to understand this 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 whole area and, and looking at it from a world perspective, where do you see see inequality going? I mean, I was surprised that inequality, you said, you know, in the last 30 years has, in actual fact, grown. I, I, I thought inequality, like a lot of technical advancements, has, has you know, gotten better and, 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 and better. And that's probably also, you know, it, it, I, I live in a, you know, comfortable world and, and so it's harder for me to, to, to observe. How, how do you see this playing out? Do, do you see that the countries around the world uh, are going to be able to turn this ship around in the next hundred years? Is it, we, we, well, like, there's obviously a little bit of an interest now from some governments that yeah. we need to look at this. It's it's actually on their political agenda. What what do you think? Well, I'm um, I'm rather pessimistic <laughs> because just as an example, uh, see for instance what what happened with COVID. It's a completely different problem, has nothing to do with inequalities. 
But we've seen there that um, those at the poorer end of the spectrum were the hardest hit by uh, COVID. And that was basically because um, they they had to take the train and the bus. They didn't have cars and they did have to go to work. Right? They couldn't go work from home, uh, et cetera. So there is, there's even in terms of infection rates, they're much higher at the poorer end of the spectrum. And the more unequal a society is, the more that becomes, you know, where you stand in the hierarchy determines how well you did during uh, COVID. Uh, also in terms of, you know, helping out, uh, helping those uh, at the poorer end of the spectrum with, um, you know, all sorts of uh, benefits, or all sorts of um, compensation that people required, uh, that, that in more unequal societies, that was just not well organized. There was, an off- there was far less efforts to help them to get through. But that's that's a problem. So the hardest hit when there is a crisis, we see the same thing when na- with natural disasters. Of course, you know the poorest are the hardest hit when there is a tornado, all those things. But the the real problem is in the rebuilding coming out of COVID. And this is again a Ms. from Oxford, uh, Oxfam, who mentioned that uh, even though. Uh, you know, economic uh, productivity rapidly declined and a lot of people lost a lot of money in the beginning of COVID. The very wealthiest in a society, they actually recovered from that financially nine months later. Whereas the at the poorer end, this often takes a decade, right? Think about uh, the Brisbane floods, for instance, Similar sort of story um, in the wealthier uh, neighbors, of course, uh, there was a lot of effort to uh, clean up. But in the poorer areas, what happened is that people just abandoned the houses and they didn't have the resources to rebuild. Right. So all those areas that were already struggling and not doing that well, when something like a flood hits, they're just unable to recover. So inequalities actually increase over time. And that is the concern, of course, because of climate change, we have um, those inequalities start to be a a massive predictor of where you actually will find uh, the the biggest sort of uh, problems in the future. If there is a drought, who is most affected? Well, those at the poorer end of the spectrum. And again, the less... Uh, if there is more equality in a community, there is more a sense of cohesion, there's more trust, there's more cooperation. So that actually the community grabs, you know, gets together and they collectively rebuild and uh, engage in those efforts. If the community is already very unequal to start with, then it's everyone for themselves. And it's very clear then that then the wealthy will, you know, rebuild but the poor, they will just sort of have to leave. And so it becomes this, and and this is, you know, again, I'm not saying that, I'm saying that's also really a bad outcome for those at the wealthier end of the spectrum, because ultimately it is that sense of community and that sense of getting through those challenges collectively that we know is, you know, is what what is needed, especially in the years to come, uh, if we are facing more and more natural disasters because of uh, climate change. But also think about communities that have to change because of, um, uh, say, the phasing out of the coal industry, uh, you know, also there, communities need to prepare for that. But if there is very little solidarity to start with, because of those inequalities, mm. they're not going to do the right thing to be prepared for those massive transitions that are going to hit them. Uh, and in the end, then you will have worse outcomes. Uh, so I'm... Um, um, I will be. In, I'm interested to see how this will unfold. Um, I think we better now. We understand the issues better now than we did probably 20, 30 years ago. Also, in the academic literature, uh, you have the 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 focus on inequality has uh, risen exponentially. People understand the dynamics better. As I said, at the political level, I also believe that there's 
far greater awareness uh, and, and understanding of this is an important problem of our time and that sometimes things are connected. Climate change mitigation, you know, you need to manage inequalities to do ch climate change mitigation effectively. So there is a lot of knowledge around, but of course it also needs a lot of uh, resources, a lot of um, uh, public support and a lot of uh, political support to, to really make a difference. It's almost that uh, to steer the ship around, it's important for that top top 20 to see that it's actually in their interests to bring everyone right. else up. And, That's absolutely and that, that does also mean distribution of wealth, which means that there, yeah. there, might, there might be a small sacrifice on the economic front for that top 20, but in actual fact, it comes back with, with, with you know, better healthcare, better education, a better, a better, a better world for their children that, that yep. they're, they're, there's a legacy that's being left for, for uh, the whole of society. And, and all of us want, you know, the reason why people want to migrate to, you know, Scandinavian countries, Australia and, and, and many others is, is because what the baseline is. And if the baseline is one where we can be compassionate and kind and, 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 and uh, you know, help those that are in need. Um, we all want to be part of a country like that. Absolutely, and I guess exactly what you're what you're uh, saying right now is this: we often we feel well now if we feel that we have a future, and if we feel that the future looks bleak because there are no opportunities or because you know it's it's uncertain, it, it's associated with challenges with stress, then we feel bad right now. So it is indeed inequalities are predictive of future negative outcomes. And that uh, is not just an economic reality. That's something that what we actually try and show in our work is occupying people's mind on a daily basis. It's mm. an important stressor that uh, we shouldn't underestimate and how it affects people's mental health uh, and the stress levels that they endure. Yolanda, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to, 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 to speak with you. Where can I find out more? Where can our listeners find out more? I know that you've written some some books. You've got lots of articles that you've published. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how do we follow up on this topic and, and find out more for ourselves? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, look, there are two books that I might want to draw your attention to. One is uh, called The Wealth Paradox. Uh, that's uh, Frank Maltz and myself. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book... Uh, uh, with uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, what we're trying to say there is really get at that issue of, well, if you're very wealthy, you have your own concerns. Uh, as I mentioned, you always feel you need more. You have that fear of falling. And we try and map out there how it affects people's political views, but also their voting behavior and their willingness to give to char charity, uh, all sorts of uh, uh uh, uh, outcomes that I think are quite important in today's society. Um, the other book is a book that uh, I recently did with uh, Kim Peters. Uh, it's called the, the the social the psychology of inequality or the social psychology of inequality. I can't remember now. Uh, it's a uh, it's a book with Springer and. Basically, what we have there is uh, uh, a lot of chapters by uh, researchers from all over the world uh, talking about the psychology of inequality, trying to understand why it is that inequality has such negative outcomes, but also, you know, what, what can we do about that and how can we change people's behavior? How can we get, you know, to, to actually uh, uh, mitigate some of those negative effects? Fantastic. I think it's uh, it's 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 lovely to 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 get a new perspective, you know, on this. I've certainly learned a lot, and 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 am surprised by you know some of these these um uh, contexts that I wasn't aware of, and you know, hopefully, this being on the agenda and becoming a conversation that's hopefully much more mainstream means that we can begin to change our behaviour, even if it's in a small way, but placing pressure on whether it's organizations whether it's governments mm. whether it's even our friends about how we how we 
um, look after one another and, and 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 the like. I think it's so important that we look at this, you know, to create a better world for 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 everyone. And you know, I'm I am the optimist. I I, I tend to feel that technology, you know, will will, will achieve so many um, you know advances, which it has. Uh, but this is this is a human requirement that that you know technology is not just going to magically do that. We need to be be much more involved. So, thank you for bringing my awareness uh, on onto this topic. Um, I, I, I didn't think that I would come away with this, and and yeah, really appreciate your expertise and and taking the time today. Well, thank you very much for having me, Nash. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, to to be able to have this chat with you. Hopefully we can catch up in some years years to come and uh, uh, see that some positives have, have come about and that, you know, some of our leaders and, and the community have, have changed the way that we're doing things, you know, uh, you know, to, to, to look at this research and begin to apply it. So, yeah, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe. Share it via social media. And tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.